Hey folks, when I was first learning the tidyverse, one of the things that really caught my eye and just really was intuitive to me was the use of pipes. Now, pipes aren't explicitly part of the tidyverse. They come from a package called MagRitter. I might be mispronouncing that. That's my Midwestern pronunciation here. Um, but the pipe character allows us to pipe uh, data from one function to another. And you, we've seen in the past episodes that we can have many, many functions connected with this pipe character. I think, and most people that use it think, that the pipe makes the code far more readable than it would be if we wrote the code um, in a nested fashion or if we wrote output of each function to a new variable. That just really gets kind of kludgy and really frustrating to use. Well, with the release of R version 4.1, Base R has introduced its own pipe character. And a few episodes ago, I got a comment asking me why I don't use the base R pipe character. And so I was familiar with the base R pipe and remember reading some of the documentation about it and thinking, eh, I don't feel like that really gains me anything. And if you know me well, you know that my brain has a limited capacity. And so trying to store information about two different piping systems is just a pain. And unless there's a really good reason to switch to this new piping system, I'm gonna stick with MagRitter. So what I wanna do in today's episode is show you what code looks like without pipes, what it looks like with base R pipes, and then what it looks like with MagRitter's pipe. Now, you may know this if you've dug into MagRitter, but the pipe we typically use is kind of the vanilla pipe, right? That percent greater than percent sign. But uh, MagRitter actually has a variety of other pipes and really useful alias functions that go along with the pipe that work great in a pipeline to help you create beautiful, readable code. Over here in our studio, you can see that I definitely have a version newer than 4.1.0. So if you don't have 4.1.0, be sure that you update your R version to get probably the latest version would work great. Um, I'm working with 4.2.1. This was released on June 23rd of 2022. There might be a newer version, I don't know. Um, and this has the great name of Funny Looking Kid. I've got a few funny looking kids running around my house. Anyway, I have a R script going called pipedemo.r and I'm gonna start it by sourcing uh, code localweather.r. It doesn't really matter what we use for this episode. I just want a data frame, a tibble, that I can work with to demonstrate using different types of pipelines. If you wanna get this file though, this R script as well as uh, pipedemo.r in its final form. Down below in the description is a link to a blog post that will show you uh, the links to get uh, the code at the beginning of this episode as well as at the end of the episode. So that script ran through and looking at the output here of local weather, I see I've got the date, the Tmax, the amount of precipitation and the amount of snow. PRCP and snow are in uh, millimeters, Tmax is in centigrade, um, and the data goes back to October 1st of 1891. I can of course wrap local weather in a tail to get the last six rows of the data frame to see that this data comes to us through um, August 13th of 2022. So the driving question that I'm gonna to use to demonstrate the use of pipes is the goal of calculating the correlation between PRCP and snow. So I'm gonna start with base R without using any pipes, okay? So we'll take local weather and I wanna get those rows that don't have an NA value and where snow is greater than zero. To do that, I'm gonna use the square brace notation that allows you to index into a row and column of a data frame. So the stuff on the left side of that comma is the row, the stuff on the right are the columns. I'm gonna leave the columns to be blank, uh, so nothing to the right of that comma, so that I get all of the data back, all of those columns back. But on the left side, I'm gonna put in some logic uh, so that I can find those rows that I want. So I'll start by removing the NA value. So I say not is.na on local weather, uh, dollar sign PRCP, and not is.na local weather, dollar sign snow, right? And so if you're not familiar with this notation, uh, local weather, dollar sign PRCP, returns that PRCP column as a vector of values, right? And so then if I do this, so not is NA, then anywhere that you see an NA is gonna come back as false, right? So is.na on an NA value will be true, the exclamation point will make that false, right? And so now we see we have trues and falses. And then when we combine this all together between PRCP and snow, we find those cases where either of these is false. And so then we'll want to remove that. And so if we look at the output of this, 
we now find a data frame that doesn't have those rows containing any NA values for PRCP or SNOW. The next thing I want to do, though, is remove these rows where SNOW is zero. To do that, I'm going to kind of clarify the logic here by putting this AND statement in parentheses so that R executes that first. And I now want local weather dollar sign snow to be greater than zero. This removes all of the rows where snow was zero, right? So we can kind of see that this is getting a little bit complicated, right? Like it's, it's not, once you kind of break it down, it's not that complicated what's going on here. But reading the code is a little bit problematic, right? It's just not as intuitive as perhaps we're used to seeing with using tools from dplyr and the rest of the tidyverse. All right, so the next thing I want to do is I want to take PRCP and Snow, and I want to look at the correlation between them, right? And so I will assign this to a variable that I'll say no NA, no uh, zero. That's a great name, huh? Um, and let's kind of break this up across different lines so we're not kind of getting all weird and scrolly. And of course, if we look at no NA, no zero, uh, we get back that data frame. So we'll do core.test and I'll do no NA, no zero, dollar sign PRCP, no NA, um, dollar sign snow. This gives us a correlation of 0.64. Cool, right? So another way that we could have written the same thing would be to say copy this down and to use the formula notation. So I'm going to take out that no na, no zero, and do data equals all that. So we can put this in the formula notation by doing PRCP plus snow, but putting a tilde before that. And so now this gives us the same result. But what allows us to do is to not have to write this ridiculous variable name over and over again, right? So you get the sense, let me clean this up a little bit, right? That, you know, this isn't so bad, but this logic statement gets a little bit messy. Um, we have to create this variable that we're then feeding into core.test, which you might not really want to do, right? And again, this is a fairly simple thing that we're doing here in base R, right? So before I start using pipes, I want to show you another approach that we might do the same thing that kind of illustrates, I think, some of the problems with this type of approach. And again, this might not be exactly how you would do it, but I've written code like this for more complicated examples. So I think it's worth kind of showing what we might do. So again, we'll do local weather and we get our data frame. So one of the first things I could do to clean up local weather, again, using tools from uh, the tidyverse, but without using the pipe, would be to do drop an A on local weather. Of course, that removes all of our NA values. And then I could call this a variable. I'll say no NAs, right? And so the nice thing is that this already cleans up the code considerably, right? So instead of all this, right, I say drop an A and I remove those rows. So that's nice. I output that to a variable I'll call no NAs. I can then do filter on no NAs. Uh, and I can then add this requirement, right, that local weather dollar sign snow be greater than zero. So this is giving me an error message, of course, that input must be size 38581 or one, not the size 47505. And so this is of length um, 47,505. This is of length 38,581, right? So this is local weather, a dollar sign snow, not no NAs, dollar sign snow. So again, if I did no NAs, dollar sign snow, that works great. And actually it's easier than that, right? I don't even need to specify the data frame because it's gonna grab snow directly from no NAs, right? And so that's the same output we had before. And we now see that snow doesn't have any zero values, right? So I'll then call this no um, NAs, no zero, right? And we're right back to what we had up here, right? So the nice thing about this is that the syntax is really intuitive. It's descriptive. Uh, there are these verbs, right, that tell you what's happening. Um, that isn't so clear as you might see up here in this base R notation where we're using these kind of Boolean terms. Of course, I could go ahead and take core.test down here to then get the same correlation value that I had up above, right? So that's basically the same idea, right? So how would we convert this into a pipe? Well, what we can do is we could take local weather, and we can use the base R pipe which is a vertical line and a greater than sign. 
And then we can say drop underscore NA. And this then gives us our data frame with no NA values. Cool, right? So we can now add to that pipeline by again using the base R pipe and then doing filter snow greater than zero. This then removes those rows that had zero um, in the snow column, right? And so now I want to extend this to do the core dot test. So I could do core dot test, and we could think about doing PRCP plus snow, and then data equals, well, what should the data equal? Well, in the MagRitter pipe, what we would normally do is put a period here, right? That would kind of be our intuition because the MagRitter pipe allows us to use the period to indicate where the data should go. If you've watched my previous episodes where I do like an inner join, I'll frequently use that period to indicate that the data coming through the pipeline should either be on the left or the right side of that inner join. But of course, when I run this, it complains because it says that um, this must be a numeric value. And so the downfall of the base R pipe here is that you can't direct the flow of the data. You can't indicate what argument it should go to. It only goes to that first argument in that function, right? So if I were to look at the help for filter, what you'll see is that the first argument for filter is dot data, right? That's the data that's being filtered. And we saw that up here, right? So the first argument was no NAs from the previous step in the pipeline, right? So the problem with the base R pipe is that I can't put the data into a slot other than that very first sl slot of the arguments, okay? So this won't work. And so what I'll have to do then is call this that no uh, NAs, no zero, right? And then um, break the pipeline here. And we'll again uh, put that no NAs, no zero in the place of the data. So let's go ahead and run these two steps. And again, we get the same correlation value. So the next thing that we'll do is let's go ahead and use the MagRitter pipe. So again, we'll take local weather. Let's get a little bit extra space in here. Uh, pipe that. And again, that's the MagRitter pipe, the percent greater than percent. And we can then do drop NA. Uh, we then get, uh, you know, all those NA rows removed. We can then pipe this to filter snow greater than zero. That then removes those rows that don't have snow. One other thing that's kind of cool about the MagRitter pipe is that you actually don't need the parentheses for the drop NA argument. If I ran those two lines, it removes those, um, those rows that had NA values. I like to leave the parentheses in to indicate that it's a function. If I do that with the base R pipe where I leave out those parentheses, it complains, right? Uh, it requires a function call as the right-hand side. So again, that's a subtle difference that I don't think is so important. I always put in the parentheses for my functions, even if there aren't arguments. But if you're using the MagRitter pipe, you don't need uh, the parentheses if there's no argument. Okay, cool. So again, we're right back to where we were um, back up here using the base R pipe. And so what I'd like to do, again, would be to pipe this to core.test and then to do tilde PRCP plus snow data equals period, right? And so that works, right? That gives us back a correlation that we've been seeing all along. I'm going to slightly tweak this. So I'm going to copy this down. And if I had instead done uh, core dot test PRCP snow data, right? So instead of using the formula notation, I use the X, Y arguments for core dot test along with data. Running that, it complains that object PRCP is not found. Okay. So the challenge is that at this point, right, data, the, the data going into data has a PRCP and snow column. But core.test, for whatever reason, can't see these column names. So what I can do instead is use a slightly different pipe that comes to us from MagRitter, which is the percent dollar sign percent. Running this, however, I see that I don't have this function. So the pipe is actually a function, right? And so this exposition pipe, as it's called, I'll write that out, exposition pipe, um, only comes from MagRitter and only the normal pipe as it's called, uh, comes into tidyverse when we load the tidyverse. So I'll come back up here and we'll do library mag ritter, get that loaded. And so now when we run this, it works great, right? And so again, the exposition pipe, what it's doing is it's allowing core.test to see um, the column names in data. So this also often comes up when people are using the LM function to create linear models, um, but it works well here for core test 
as well. I think in the previous episode, I created a variable that had the filter data, and then I used that data explicitly, that data frame explicitly, as the argument to a data argument like this in core.test. And I didn't have to do that, right? I could have used that exposition pipe, that percent dollar sign percent, after loading mag reader, and so that's pretty slick. For the most part, when we use the normal pipe of the percent greater than percent, that's what I consider the normal pipe, um, that, that it's one direction, right? Like the pipe goes from point A to point B, and while it does different operations in between, there's no bifurcations, right? Well, there actually is a T pipe that comes to us from MagRitter that allows you to kind of bifurcate uh, the pipeline in a way. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab a couple lines of this to demonstrate the T pipe, right? Where we take um, local weather drop NA filter, and I'm gonna go ahead then and to um, use the T pipe. So it's percent T greater than percent. Could then do plot and then pipe that to summarize, and we could say uh, total uh, PRCP, and we can then do sum on PRCP. And what we get out, we obviously see this total precipitation of 17,682 millimeters of total precipitation, but we also see the plot out here, right? And so something to keep in mind is that the plot function is a base R plotting tool that doesn't have any output. It doesn't return anything to the screen, right? Something that you might want to do is like, well, what if instead of plot, I wanted to do something like ggplot, and we could do like AES x equals PRCP, y equals snow, uh, and then we could do like plus uh, geom point, right? That's something that I would like to do, right? And unfortunately, that complains because um, just the, I think the setup of ggplot and how it kind of adds things together, it doesn't do a good job of working with uh, that T pipe. In general, I don't find a lot of good use for the T pipe. What I would say is create this as a variable, what I have highlighted here, and then feed that into ggplot and separately feed that into summarize. One place where this could be useful though, would be to do something like um, print, right? And so print will output to the screen. And we now see basically what the pipeline looked like after the filter, right? Perhaps what you could do is you could use this to help you debug what's going on, right? And so I can put another T pipe in there and I can output the data frame at these different steps in the pipeline, right? So here it is with the NAs removed, here it is with those zeros and snow removed, and then here is the summation of all that data, right? Again, I don't get a whole lot of use out of using uh, the T pipe, your mileage may vary. So if you remember a number of episodes back, I talked about making distance matrices. And one of the things I was always having to do would be to kind of break out of the pipeline to add row names or to remove row names or do things like that. Well, it turns out that there's actually tools like that built into MagRitter that make it easy to use these functions within a pipeline. So let's go ahead and for fun, let's make a 96 well plate that we can label the columns with letters and the rows with numbers. And so what I might do would be one to 96, right? And so that gives me uh, that vector. And I could then pipe that into um, the matrix function. So I could do matrix on that. And of course that then gives me a 96 row matrix. But of course let's do n call equals 12. And so now giving us a little bit more breathing room, uh, we see that we have 12 columns and eight rows, right? So this is a matrix, right? And so if you go to the aliases page on the magritter.tidyverse.org uh, reference page, and I'll put a link um, on the screen here so you can better see what's going on, there's a variety of aliases that you can use uh, to do different manipulations of the pipeline. So let's go ahead and create those labels so we can use set call names to set the columns and to set row names to set the row names. So again, we'll come back to our pipeline and I can do set uh, uh, underscore call names and we'll do uh, letters or ca all caps letters, letters one to 12, right? And so now we see we've got those column names. Again, before what I'd have to do would be to say, this is my plate and then set call names plate equals letters one to 12, which is just kind of messy. So let me just show you real quick. So if I did plate on that, I would then have to do row names on plate uh, being one to eight, right? And so now if I look at plate, oh, plate, I see I've got my row names there, right? But I have to break out of the pipeline to do that. And that's just not necessary, right? So instead what we could do would be to do set row names one to eight. And now if I run all this, I now get the same output as having run row names plate. 
So now we've created a pipeline to create and label a 96 well plate. Something else we could do is then pipe this to an add function. And I could say add 10. And so now I've added 10 to all values of uh, that data frame. Or I could do subtract 10 to remove 10. I could do multiply by 10. Oop, oh, this spelled it, multiply by, right? And then divide by 10, right? So there's a variety of these alias functions that allow us to manipulate the attributes and the values of this matrix. So I can convert this from a matrix to a data frame by then doing as.data.frame, right? So now it's a data frame. And then I could say use series, uh, and then I could put in D to get back the D column, right? And so that gives me a vector of D values. As the documentation shows you, use series is a lot like using the percent sign. Alternatively, I could do extract on D, and for that, I need to put that in quotes, and that then is a lot like select on D, right? Uh, that gives me that column, and if I do extract two, that's equivalent to using two square braces that basically extracts a vector from a list, and so now I go back to having that vector. So again, I want to just kind of expose you to these different alias functions that come to us from the MagRitter package to enable us to make more readable and more attractive pipelines versus kind of, you know, the things that we saw way back up here uh, when we were doing, you know, the stuff with kind of nesting Boolean stuff in it or creating temporary variables that we were then feeding to uh, downstream functions. It's just a little bit too kludgy, right? As opposed to when we start thinking about using um, the MagRitter pipes, using things like the normal pipe or the exposition pipe, or as I showed you down here, using the T-pipe to kind of bifurcate the pipeline. I don't find, that, again, that the T-pipe does a whole lot to help me. Um, so your mileage may vary there. I encourage you to experiment with that. There's another pipe that uses an exclamation point. That's called the eager pipe. To be honest, I don't totally understand it, and I've never really had a great use for it. This gets into the process of what's called lazy evaluation, which, again, I've filmed a couple hundred of these videos so far, and I've had no need to really be too concerned about lazy evaluation, so I suspect you might not either. But if that's something you worry about, know that there is that other pipe out there, the eager, the eager pipe. So I almost forgot that there's one more version of the pipe that I'd like to share with you. Uh, and so again, I'm gonna go ahead and grab uh, these three lines where we did the drop NA and the filter and bring it down. And again, we see that local weather, we filtered out the NAs, we filtered out the zeros for the snow precipitation, right? And so not necessarily in this situation, but sometimes we would like to save this back to a variable. So I could save this as clean data, right? And so now I come down here and I have clean data and I have that data stored as that variable, right? Well, maybe I don't wanna save it as clean data. Maybe I actually wanna write it back over local weather. What would we do then? Well, what you could do is we could imagine taking this down and instead of using the right pointing pipe, right? We could use the less than and greater than sign within the pipe character, right? So basically what's gonna happen is it's gonna use the local weather, it's gonna feed it into drop A and then into filter, and it's then gonna write it back over local weather. So again, local weather looks like this now, but now when I run the data frame and come back and run local weather again, it's now been cleaned up by going through these two steps, right? So. I'm not a big fan or big user of this assignment pipe, uh, but know that it is available if you're doing a whole lot of cleaning up of your data and you don't wanna be you know, creating another variable. Um, ultimately, it makes me a little bit uneasy to basically use the input as the same as the output. Because say I screwed something up in here, well, then I've gotta go back and regenerate local weather and then come all the way through here. And so that, you know, that, that's just an extra step and it's not that much to store the data at least once as a temporary variable local weather. So I hope you found this interesting. And again, for my use, I don't know that I really have a great benefit to going back to the base R pipe. Uh, people will say that, well, on the other side of the ledger um, of the balance, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, trade-offs of things, that the MagRitter pipe has a little bit slower performance. It requires you to load MagRitter. 
Again, these are not things that I'm really concerned about. I'm not worried about that level of performance enhancement to go back uh, and use the base R pipe. Um, my fingers are so well trained that you don't know how hard it is for me to write that base R pipe versus the mag redder pipe. Anyway, let me know if you find a situation where you do prefer using that base R pipe. At the end of the day, I feel like the mag redder pipe is a lot more powerful for the types of things I do. Again, that main difference being being able to insert data from the pipeline at a specific point that's not that first argument. All right, well, practice with this. Tell your friends all about the different piping options. I think if you can explain to them what I've talked about today, then you will definitely be well on your way to understanding the different types of pipes and what you can do with them here in R. Keep practicing, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.